Can you remember what it was like when you were just a child and you were free playing in the snow or jumping in the leaves? Maybe you can remember riding your bike and the wind just blowing through your hair. Maybe you can remember just running around and dancing and singing and feeling so uninhibited, so free and so alive, so free to be your true self. And you honestly didn't even care what other people thought or what they were saying about how you were being. You were just being yourself. And then you noticed one day you started to not have that same feeling anymore. You started to dim your light and you suddenly didn't feel like it was safe or it was okay to be that free and uninhibited, uninhibited person that you were as a child. Maybe you experienced rejection, ridicule, being ostracized. In this episode, my guest, Tegrilia Gardenia, and I talk about this very topic. And she shares and I share our experiences in childhood of how we went from this place of being free and uninhibited to a place of not feeling worthy to shine our light. Tegrilia shares with us her experience and her expertise as a coach and how she helps others to have the confidence with using nature to be able to find our way back to being able to find your light and finally shine your light once again. She offers some really concrete, actionable steps that you can use when you're just starting to figure out how to shine your light again. Welcome to the Masks Off for People Pleasers and Perfectionists podcast. I am Kim Gross, your host, and it is my mission to help you unmask from people pleasing and perfectionistic behaviors so that you can finally have the confidence to live the life that you truly desire. Let's tune in to this week's episode. So welcome to the show. And why don't you take this moment to introduce yourself? First, let me say this. I'm going to preface by saying, as a recovering perfectionist, we're going to start right out right from the jump, <laughs> that I'm not going to try to be all perfect about how this podcast plays <laughs> out and try to do everything just the right way. So I'm going to just practice what I preach. And I'm going to allow you to just introduce yourself in your own words, sharing your name so that I don't botch it. And then I don't have to beat myself up for not being able to say your name perfectly. <laughs> I like it. If it's any consolation, I usually, when people ask me my name, I say it three different ways, just to make sure that whomever is in front of me can comfortably pick one of the three ways. What we want to talk about today is this whole concept and idea of how as a perfectionist, a people pleaser, a woman, a little girl, we can go to this place of dimming our light where at one point in time, we knew inside ourselves, in every cell of our being, we knew, we felt that we were whole, we were worthy, we were divine. And that might have showed up or shown up as running around, playing, laughing, jumping in the snow, jumping in the leaves, doing cartwheels, dancing, singing, and not giving a fuck about what other people were thinking, what other people were saying. We were just being our true nature. Mm -hmm. And then something shifts. Yep. And we start to dim our light. 
And I know that you have a story that is similar. So I would love for you to share with me and with the audience your story and examples that you shared with me before of how you dim your, how you have in the past watched yourself dim your light around others. Let's start yeah. there. I love the way that you put it because it is true. I think there are periods of our lives where we're so carefree. I've always had a lot of energy. I've always been super curious. And so I've always done a lot of things. I was the chunky kid who still did years of ballet and modern dance and jazz, loved mathematics. So I was always like advanced and I would get in trouble in class because I learned really fast so I tend to process things very quickly. And then I would just chit chat and be like the funny one that was with everybody. And my teachers would constantly write on my like report cards, grasp concepts quickly distracts the class after. So literally at one point they took my desk and you know how you have the blackboard back then it was a blackboard, not a whiteboard, blackboard at the front of the classroom. They literally put my desk against the blackboard a little off to the side because mm -hmm. I kept distracting the class because I already understood and knew what they were talking about. At that age, I started to see that this concept of me being fast could be a problem. The fact that, so even though I still was going forward with a lot of things, I played on a softball team and I wasn't necessarily great at everything, but I did it. I played on the volleyball team for a while and I'm not a good volleyball player, by the way, I can't jump to save my life. But when I was really young and you just had to dig, I was pretty good back then. <laughs> and so I would just try things. I didn't have a fear of sticking myself into something and seeing where it was. And I got into this place. But then I realized that there was, there got to be a point in that journey where I was trying out a bunch of things and the people around me weren't, they were specializing in certain aspects or worse, they were trying things and weren't really getting the results that they expected or these other aspects. And because I was good at a lot of things, what ended up happening is that in order to support my friends. I would take the things that they didn't do well. So it's a really weird dimming your light because it's not the type where I'm necessarily self-sabotaging overall when you look at it from the outside. I'm not necessarily holding back in everything. But what I realized was I was holding back on all the things that my friends were good at to give them space because I could be good at other stuff. And what ended up happening was that I found myself at some point where I had let go of all of my creative talents. I had never pushed them forward. And I had focused on all my organizational and analytical stuff because my friends couldn't do that or they didn't want to do that. I often say I went from being on the stage to being in the shadows, to mm. being in the backstage. So much so that when I worked with Cirque du Soleil, I was in the backstage even though I had co-owned a circus before going to Cirque du Soleil and had, and the same thing had happened there. Like I had first started where I joined this group of people and I had done some performancey stuff. And then I became a tech and I started to move farther and farther back because again, all these creative folks couldn't do that piece. So I live in a place called Domenher. It's one of the largest spiritual eco communities in the world. So as part of your spiritual path, at some point, you choose what you call your first law. It's like you look at yourself, not so much as just this life, but more completely. And you say, what are the things that I really need mm -hmm. to work on in order for me to be the best me I can be in this lifetime, but taking into account everything. And that was where I finally decided after years of holding myself back from my friends or for fear of shining too bright and other people getting jealous or being afraid and years of standing on stage to do things and then having somebody important in my life tap me on the shoulder and say, I want to be on that stage. And, but you're so good at this other stuff. Can you do this other stuff so I can be on the stage? And me doing it, I literally had one friend of mine who I love dearly, and we did talk it out afterwards, but she literally got upset with me because I was, she was holding back from including me in things that we had started together because she knew I would be better at the part she wanted to do. And it was like, 
And I was so afraid of losing friends because of this and relationships because you can't shine more than your partner and all these types of things, especially being a woman, it's still taboo, especially in Italy. And so I finally got to the point where I was like, I can't do this anymore. This isn't me. Mm. And I don't feel like I'm really fulfilling my life purpose. I like being behind the stage, but I also like being on stage in whatever format that takes. I had created a construct in my head where the reason I couldn't be on the stage was because I wasn't as good as the people who only dedicated themselves to the stage and therefore I would embarrass myself. So that was like my, rather than trying to put understanding that whole thing about my friends and what was going on around me, I put it onto myself that it was like, so-and-so does this only, therefore I should give them the space because if I go up there, because I only do this as part of multiple things that I do, being a multi-potentialite, I'm going to, I'm going to embarrass myself and I can't embarrass myself that way. So it's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Let's break some of that down because you really did hone in on and you underscored two major characteristics, one of the people pleaser and one of the perfectionist. And the perfectionist one you just said was, I, what I heard underneath is I'm not good enough to be on stage and do these particular things because I don't specialize in it or I'm not specific mm -hmm. enough in it. So I'm not good enough for that. And what even piggybacks on that is the imposter syndrome. Who am I to think that I'm good enough to do that when this person over here, they spend so much time and energy specializing in doing this, that they are much better at being on stage than I am when I'm just good at everything, but not great at one thing. So I heard that yep. major sign of perfectionist. And then the other one is, which I so relate to, is this fear of losing friends or relationships for showing up, <laughs> outshining, being our true selves. And this is where we really start to dim the light. I can remember clearly having experiences in high school where if one of my really good friends would say, oh my God, you're so smart. Look at, you got straight A's this quarter. I could remember really downplaying and saying, oh, but you're so good at, but no, it's nothing like, but you're so good at this and blah, blah, blah. I would want to make them feel better. I became, resp I was becoming responsible for their feelings. Number one, that's not my job to be responsible for how someone else feels. And because I was afraid that I might lose that relationship if I was too smart or too athletic or too popular, too whatever. I was afraid to lose that relationship. So I downplayed it. Mm -hmm. I yeah. downplayed that. Absolutely. Not only that, you make your effort, try to look effortless. Yeah. And so you're, you downplay more than even just what your accomplishments are. You downplay the entire process. So when you struggle, you try to be quiet about it because people are struggling more than you are. I don't want to burden them by telling them how hard it is, like that I'm struggling or any of that because they've got their own stuff to worry about. And I don't want to upplay what I've created and accomplished because I don't want them to feel bad because they haven't gotten there. Or I don't want them to, I don't want to bring this up too much because I feel like they're going to find the, the flaws in it. Even though there's this amazing piece that I've done, they're going to find the places where I didn't do enough or I didn't do it right or anything like that. And so it's this weird deck of cards we create for ourselves. You're doing such an amazing job of describing these characteristics of either the people pleaser or perfectionist. And you just described another characteristic of the people pleaser, which is I don't want any attention on me. First of all, I'm not going to let you know that I'm struggling. I'm not going to let you know that I have any needs. I don't have any needs. Uh, you know, 
Totally I'm self-sufficient. I'm here I'm to help so, you. Yes, I'm here uh, to help you. Yes. Oh my God. Such bullshit. Yep. So let's talk about, because let's talk about how this happens. How do we get to this freaking point? I have, I know from my experience, but let's talk about it because like I started in the beginning of this episode, we were all just children playing in the snow, playing in the leaves, dancing, riding our bikes, feeling the wind in our hair, feeling so free, so uninhibited. And then now we dim our light and we take right. on these patterns, these tendencies to please and perfect. So do you know when the defining moment was for you when it started? I think, to the, shift? I think it started to shift in a few different ways. One was the fact that, as I said, I was like the, I was very tall. I've always been tall. And so I was tall. I was heavy set because actually I was heavy set for most of my, for all of my childhood. So I had this sort of piece of, okay, where am I supposed to fit in? And like the scale of schools, I wasn't in the popular beauty type piece. I was with the nerds, but I was a little bit, but I had then this creative side. So I was also with the theater people and I was in this. So I think in part it starts because you don't have a quote unquote click. Mm -hmm. And so you feel like you need to dim some piece of you in order to enter into one of those categories that exist. I, I think that's a little bit different today, but I think in our generation, especially as women, as girls, there was a lot of, you need to find a place to fit in. You have to identify with some group. And I didn't identify with any group 100% because I was multi-passionate always. So I would be with the dancers for a little period of time, but I didn't look like a dancer because I was heavy set, even though I was a, a very graceful and very flexible. And I had all these other pieces going for me, but I didn't have the slender body. So I didn't fit there. I was with like the smart nerds, but I was also really good socially. So I didn't fit into what that click stereotypically fit into, which is people who are much more awkward. I was a heavy metal girl, but I was also smart and heavy metal people should be stupid, which is <laughs> totally not true, by the way. Just don't believe any of that. That's crap. That's what the stereotype. So all of these pieces at some point when I was, and then eventually when I went to college, in particular, I think the beginning of my college years, that became very prominent. The fact that I didn't have both feet into anything. And there is this mythology that gets created. And this is where I think many, the reason I specialize in my work as a coach and as a mentor in multi-potentialites and creatives is because there is this mistaken belief that when you have too many passions, it's because you're distracted. Instead of thinking, no, I actually can be good at a lot of different things because I have learned how to expertly weave them together into a series of movements in my life that you might not be able to understand. But since I'm connected to my life purpose, I know where I'm going. But it's very hard for the outside world to see it because they have this idea that longevity in something is the way that you go rather than jumping around. So I, at the time when I was younger, it was more like settle down and pick something. And it was like, why? And that was where I think it really started. I think there was a lot of good intentions by people around me, like my family. And with the idea of helping you concentrate on something, but what they didn't understand was my real superpower was the fact that I didn't concentrate on things. And that is not something that gets, especially at a young age, you don't necessarily give that the weight and the encouragement that it should have. And then after that, because you don't have a click, when you switch from one group to the other, your friends feel betrayed. Like, why are you hanging out with them? So I want to go back a little bit to what you're saying about the multi, what is multi potentialite potentialites. I had never heard that word before, but I do. I, I picked up on something which is that I do feel society did condition us, especially back in our generation, because I can remember being told that it's not a good idea 
to jump around and have different jobs. I'm talking about part-time jobs. Right. When you're going to get your real job or whatever, or college, you don't want a future employee or so-and-so to see that you job hop because that might mean that you're unreliable or you're not good at what you do. But that's such BS. Like, I feel like I try to encourage my kids, my daughter's in college, and so she has part-time jobs. Have as many as you can so you can explore what Absolutely. your interests are, what you're good at, what your talents are. And not only that, but even colleges fall into that trap of declare your major by the time you're a sophomore, by the time you're freaking 19 years old, we want yep. you to know what you want to do with the rest of your life. And if you're going to have a double major, you should still know that by 19, 19 freaking years old. Yep. That's a baby still. Yeah. No wonder there's so much pressure on our young adults because they feel like I have to declare and find out and decide what I want to do with the rest of my life now at 19. So it's what you're saying is not encouraged to explore and be good at many different things and, and find a way to weave that all together. I, for one, follow the path I did. I just did a podcast episode on this. I went to high school, graduated, went to college, went to get my master's, became a teacher because I didn't know what else to do. And it just felt like I had a lot of teachers in my family. So I became a teacher. My parents paid for my whole education. I taught for five years and then I got pregnant and I didn't work outside the home for 24 years. Talk about not debunking the path and going in a totally different direction. Now, I will say this. Because of the work that I do and that I'm introspective and I reflect on things, I know that teaching is inherently a part of who I am. I loved playing teacher when I was seven, eight, nine years old. I was like, that was my most favorite thing to play was teacher. I would play with my cousin, but I also play by myself and I'd have my imaginary students and the chalkboard and all of that. And even now, as I do the podcast, I am teaching. It's a form of teaching. So I know that it's in me to teach, but a lot of our young people aren't really afforded that opportunity to really explore what is it that's in your heart? What is your passion? What do you enjoy doing? I feel like you are doing what you enjoy doing as well. Would you say that you are at this point? Oh, absolutely. And I think I had the luck of the fact that I'm extremely strong-willed and I, I devise meaning on my own. For example, taking the example that you just gave about the fact that you knew that you were a teacher, to me, that is what I call your deep pattern. And this is what I help my clients identify. The deep pattern is the way that you express whatever you're doing. At that point, once you get to that, you can do it in any form. So for a period of time, you did it as an actual teacher. For a period of time, you did it as a mother. For a period of time, you did it, you're doing it as now, as a podcaster. You're doing it in all these different ways. But ultimately, you are always, in order for you to really reach your purpose, to really feel like you're doing something, regardless of the actual passion that is being involved, you could be doing art, but teaching it. You could be like being in a, with a group of kids being like, I don't know the, what's it called? The play date mom, but you still find a way to teach. It's, it's an inherent way of a pattern or what we call in Dom and Her, the element that is you. And therefore you're going to express it in any way. Way you want. Once a, a person realizes what their element is, they can switch, like you said, from passion to passion. So if I was looking at a resume and I see a person that's switching from job, I'm more looking at the responsibilities that they had, the roles that they had. And if the roles and the responsibilities tend to be the same, so like somebody was always either in a leadership role or somebody was always in an individual contributor where they supported the team itself, like maybe they were a project manager always, you could switch from role to role and, but from position to position, but I could see that those roles are the deep pattern that you express. And I think that's one of the ways that we start to 
shine our light because it becomes less about whether I'm dancing or whether I'm making art or whether I'm being an actuary or whether I'm working in a funeral home, but it becomes much more about the pattern that I'm expressing for myself. It didn't matter because it's the pattern that's important. And that I think is what helps us step into our true light, that authentic light, because the light becomes easier to shine when you realize that it's something of the archetype that is you rather than the individual passion that you have. So for somebody that just feels really crappy, like they just know they're not, they're not shining their light. They're not being their true selves. And they don't even know where to begin. Like they don't have that big perspective like you just shared with us. What would you say would be like a starting point for someone to start to recognize? I would say that a starting point that I often start with my clients is to go towards when you look back and you look at all the things you've done, and that could be work experience family experience. It could be civic work. It could be volunteers. It doesn't matter. Even when you Mm. were a kid and you were just playing or when you're playing with your friends, is there a role you naturally step into, right? It's like when you you remember when we used to play Monopoly as a kid, right? There was always the person who always wanted to be the dog, the person that always wanted to be the shoe, the person who always wanted to be like the little uh, car. And there's a reason for that. The car person might've been a person who in any role that they took tended to be the one that went fast, the one that moved the needle forward, the one that was pushing things in another way. The dog might have been a person who was always more of a support person. I'm a person that no matter what role I'm doing in whatever kind of organization or project or even my own personal thing, I'm the support beam. I'm the one people can lean on. I'm the one that encourages others and gives them unconditional love and helps them like just be and that. Or maybe I'm the shoe. I'm the one that's always there to move step things and to give like balance. So I provide balance. I provide an even keel. (laughs) And so to look first and foremost as what is the thing that you naturally have always gravitated toward in whatever position you've been in in life. And from there, then look at that and then see how do you step more into it? How do you let that, because that's where your light is hiding. It's hiding inside of that. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter again, if it's through music or it's through business or whatever, it, that doesn't matter. What matters is the type of person that you are within it and to shine from there. So then tell us a little bit more about what you do. You mentioned that this is what you do with your clients. Yeah, I'm a nature inspired mentor and a personal evolution coach. So my specialization is actually plant intelligence. I work very closely with the natural world because Mm -hmm. these are the types of deep patterns that we see in nature. We see deep patterns that connect big ecosystems. Certain types of species always carry out these types of patterns, whether they're doing it with color or scent or smell or electrical signals or any of the other aspects. So My work is really about helping multi-potentialites, people with so many passions, creatives, and what we call naturepreneurs. So people who want to have a business that is connected to the natural world in some way. Really, I help them design their naturally conscious life. So a life in which they feel like they're consciously making the choices that help them thrive. So it's really about finding confidence, about understanding your deep patterns, about really thinking about your passions more as tools rather than expressions of you directly, because it is actually your deep pattern, your element that is your real expression. And then how does that get you towards your life purpose? You are such an interesting person. Like this has (laughs) been a very interesting conversation for sure. So how can listeners find you if they want to reach out to you? I am super easy to find. So I have my website, which is my name, tigriagardenia.com. And I also am the founder of something called the Naturally Conscious Community. And the Naturally Conscious Community is an online ecosystem where we really work with 
the intelligence and the wisdom of plants to develop these naturally conscious lives. So it's a place for us to have hard conversations. It's a safe space. It's a space for us to, I tend to say, actually, my I have a podcast myself, and the episode that just came out is called How Weird Is Your uh, Extraordinary Superpower? Because I really believe that we need to create unique paths that take us where we want to be going, rather than trying to fit ourselves into the mold, which is, I think, that perfectionist piece of, I'm supposed to fit in here. And so so my naturally conscious community is a place for us to look to nature and work with nature to really develop those unique paths to our life. People, if you found this conversation interesting, definitely reach out for sure. I just loved it. I loved having you on. It was such a connected conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am always excited to be sharing and I, and I love this angle that you have of really helping us step beyond because as you said, that perfectionism takes many different forms. And I think we really need to help people explore it so that they can understand that it's not something that we have to live in all the time. It has its place where it could be really useful, but it also has its place where it's trying to protect you so much that it actually holds you back. A hundred percent. And I'm glad that you recap because that is the mission and the purpose of this podcast is to illuminate all the different ways in which either the people pleaser or perfectionistic pattern can show up. A lot of times people, including myself, were misinformed or just under the illusion that it just showed up in a few couple of ways, but there are so many nuances to both of the patterns. And I think we uncovered some of those today. And so I'm really glad that we had the conversation for sure. And me too. Thank you so much for this conversation and for also all the work that you're doing, helping so many out there. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. So thank you everybody for listening to another episode of Masks Off. I am Kim Gross and I will see you next week.